my favorite lines is from the incredible scholar Zangia Robinson, who says, it's not about a, appropriation, it is about obliteration. obliteration. Because when you are obliterated, you are erased, your contributions are negated. And in the process of doing that, mm -hmm. your ability to make money mm -hmm. is, is, is cut into. Yeah. And so it is the obliteration um, that this film sets to correct. Everybody, this is Mike and I'm with Tisa. And you're watching The Real Black Podcast. Today we've got a great guest. If you can't read the description, if you haven't read the description, it's Lisa Cortez, who is the director of the upcoming documentary, Little Richard, I Am Everything. Everything. It's just like a shot out of a cannon. His voice? The... My God, who is that? He created the rock and roll icon. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. It wasn't Elvis. I am the king of rock and roll! The first songs that you love that your parents hate is the beginning of the soundtrack of your life. Little Richard's lyrics were too lewd to get airplay on the radio. They was not that dirty. They were just as clean as you were. Hey, Lisa. Hello, Mike. Hi, Hi. Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Congratulations on Thank Little you. Richard. Thank you so much. Now, people, I know people are just starting to see the ads and everything. But this is big stuff. I mean, we've been hearing about this since Sundance. Uh, it is so excited to move from the festival circuit where we've had an amazing reception and get to the to the world. Because, um, you know, Little Richard, he, he's about, you know, I think it's a film in conversation with so many different people. It is not a story of the past. There are themes explored in the film that are really relevant to this time that we're living in right now. Well, what attracted you to, to this topic, Lisa? So uh, in May of 2020, when little Richard passed away, uh, I was like most people spending all my time inside because of the pandemic. And one of the great bombs was to hear his music because people were, you know, saying he's passed and he had these great hits and just feeling the joy, you know, of uh, that was so infectious in his work. And then I started rec seeing that these really interesting people were paying tribute to him that I wouldn't have expected, you know, Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters, Elton John, and, and to then realize that there had not been a feature film documentary on Little Richard is what I like to say catnip for me. Great job, you know, with the film for sure. I mean, I'd read his biography years ago and, you know, and I have to give you a lot of credit because one of my pet peeves about documentaries, especially about artists, is that, you know, a lot of times, especially after people pass, we don't get to hear them tell their own story in their own words. You know, can you talk about the decision to tell the story that way as opposed to having experts come in and speak for him? Well, um, when I started this film, I realized pretty quickly that I wanted to give Little Richard the mic <laughs> um, for him to tell his story, to give him agency. Because, you know, so many times in the course of his life, he is, ha, has been made invisible. He's been muted. And so this is a, a, an act of restoration and centering his voice. So one of the first things that I had the team do, the archival team, is they conducted a very deep dive um, to see if we could find Richard narrating his life story for so from cradle to grave. And once I knew that we had his voice to tell the story, I felt comfortable that um, I had a really strong scaffolding to then construct the film. 
But what I also knew is that Richard, as many of his friends in, in the film talk about, was not always the most reliable narrator of his story. Um, and so then that informed who I interviewed additionally to fill out the story or at times actually be almost in conversation with him, calling him out on things that he presents as the truth. Yes. Do you think um, part of the reason, like you say, he wasn't the best narrator of his own story? He had. A, he seemed to have lived a very conflicted life at times between his belief in God, his love for God, and his love for music. And of course, in being raised in a Christian world, you know, you're told you choose one or the other. So it was like he was always back and forth with his beliefs and he seemed a little conflicted at times. So. Yeah. You know, I mean, listen, I think all of us at times are unreliable narrators of our story. Okay. Um, you know, that's, that is what it, for me, what it means to be beautifully human yeah. um, is, at, but what I think was, you're touching on something that is part of the poignancy of Richard's journey is it was very difficult for him to rectify being a man of God, a godly man, and being a rock and roll sinner. And so oftentimes on his journey, he gives up the rock and roll lifestyle and he goes to Bible college. Absolutely. He goes back to rock and roll. He goes to selling Bibles. You know, it's like a roller coaster that he is on as he tries to reconcile his consistent love of God. He never stopped believing. He never stopped loving God. But he also had this pull to the music, to the rock and roll, to the adulation, to, you know, everything that comes with that. And being queer. Yes. You know, the, um, aligning the queerness with the rock and roll plus the 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 what he had been drummed into him that you know these are things that are not of god's word god's plan That's and it's very hard to break out of what you have been taught from an early age but there's also i the more i think about it inherent conflicts in Richard's origin story, i.e. his father was a minister and he owned a nightclub yeah. and he was a bootlegger. Yes. Now, according to this construct of the world that Richard lived in, that did not make sense. That was not approved. So, uh, you know, um, it, and so it, it's it's the, com the rich complexity of, of his story that I think is where the magic comes from in, mm -hmm. in Richard's um, journey. Yeah, he's definitely flamboyant. The quasar <laughs> of rock and roll. Yeah, he has yeah. such a freedom about him. And, you know, I, I really enjoyed watching this biopic documentary. You put it together beautifully. Um, I, I love seeing some of his church influences. Now, like you said, his father was a minister. Uh, but it seemed in the film, he actually attended two different types of congregations. One was the Baptist, where they're really like solemn and quiet. And then he would go to the AME. And that's where he seemed to have really got his fire and saw how it's really done when the spirit hit. Um, one of the main artists, well, I'm saying artists, but she was amazing, was Rosetta Tharp, who was the gospel. She She was amazing. Um, one of the other singers, Ma Marion, there was a certain thing that she would do in the film that I said, that's where he got that woo from. So it was like, several, you really highlighted some of the gospel artists that he really got that from. And it was just beautiful watching. You know? Yeah, Brother Joe May, uh, Clara Ward, Marion, who mm -hmm. gave you a woo woo woo. Yes. <laughs> And then, you know, Sister Rosetta Tharp is so interesting because she comes from the church. She's gospel, 
but she plugs in the guitar. She electrifies the, yes. and brings the rock and roll to the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so many scholars and great musicians see her as one of the important mothers of rock and roll. Absolutely. She was well, a true performer. <laughs> One one of the directorial flourishes, and this is your, I guess, your second film directing. I mean, you have a whole history, Emmy Awards and Oscars and everything producing, but. This is my first solo uh, directing. Uh, previously, I co-directed All in the Fight for Democracy, and then the remake, Hip Hop Times Fashion, um, and then produced the Apollo on the Apollo Theater, um, you know, and, and other films. Uh, so. Um, I've been slowly creeping precious. up. Oh, yes, executive, executive produced precious. Executive produced precious. Awesome. So I've slowly been creeping up on the director's uh, chair. Um, and coming from a background in the music industry, loving history, <laughs> loving Little Richard, mm -hmm. and wondering why he was in the in the big picture, not given his flowers the way he should have was kind of what inspired me to tell this story. Oh, he definitely would be crying and giving you all kinds of hugs if, after seeing this film. Yes. Um, you do such a great job. And one, one of the things I really appreciated was the nod that you give to some new artists in terms of recreating moments um, in Richard's life or re, re, per, like performing certain songs. I mean, can you talk about the decision to do that? Uh, so you're referring to what I call my dreamscapes. Um, from the beginning, when we took the film out to pitch it, to sell it, I always knew I wanted to have moments of dreamscapes that I consider portals. These are seminal moments in Richard's life where emotionally something happens, something, as we call it, shifting the atmosphere possibility occurs so um and i knew i wanted contemporary artists who were a part of richard's legacy to perform the songs associated with these moments um valerie june is an incredible americana artist she you know herself is a black woman plays folk play rock and roll she it loves, knew all about Sister Rosetta Tharp. So, you know, for her to play this Sister Rosetta Tharp's big hit, Strange Things Happen Every Day, um, which was one of Richard's favorite songs because Rosetta was one of his favorite artists, was my way of making a film that feels a little bit more immersive. Um, my way of decolonizing documentary music documentaries like they're supposed to be told this way no they're not i'm intentional in my choice of who are the scholars that i feature young queer brilliant scholars i'm intentional in having corey henry who comes from a background in the church but himself as a recording artist performs not only gospel, but R&B, funk, and jazz. Um, you know, he is, we are all, we all have a little bit of Little Richard's DNA on us. And specifically for the artists in the film, performing in the dreamscapes, they have um, an organic connection to the material. And John um, P. Key, he was amazing. And John P. Key, who knew Little Richard, and even though he is performing one of his songs and not a Little Richard song, I chose that song because it's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. I love John P. Key. Uh, and I felt it also spoke emotionally to where Little Richard was at that time. He was at his lowest. And he truly is standing in the need of prayer because mm -hmm. he has to leave a lifestyle behind that is not serving him. Mm -hmm. And it is through prayer and, and reigniting his relationship with God that he then moves on to the next chapter of his life. 
Yes. Mick Jagger, Nona Hendricks, Tom Jones, Billy Porter. It was great to hear them speak about him and they had a direct contact with them throughout their lives as well. Uh, how did you get them involved with the film? Um, persistence, okay. <laughs> passionate letters. Um, and, you know, I think it's always when you're reaching out to talent, once you get to the right conduit, it, uh, people, you know, these artists were like, yes, I think you can tell in Nick Jagger's interview in the film, mm -hmm. he's very open, he's giving, he really talks a lot about how much he got from Little Richard. Yes. Um, you know, same with Tom Jones. He's like, I, you know, I would come to the States and go visit him. Yeah. Um, you know, I loved him like a brother. Nona Hendrix, you know, we know her from LaBelle, but Nona's had an incredible career also as a rock and roll artist, mm -hmm. experimental. She was on the Chitlin circuit with Little Richard. So there, you know, these big names are there because they had an intimate connection sure. to Richard. Um, you know, once again, I am very intentional in the casting of these supplementary voices in the film mm -hmm. um, because they truly had um, these great stories to tell. Um, and I think they, it was necessary to have them in conversation with the stories that Richard is telling. Uh, I love where someone said uh, he created the template for rock and roll. And then Billy Porter said, sorry, y'all, it wasn't Elvis. So I was like, yeah, I mean, we really have to awaken to like the fact that he was the originator of, of, of rock and roll. You know? <laughs> He was he's an important, Tisa, he's an important architect, absolutely. Oh, and the question, this film is not anti-Elvis, but what this film, you know, looks at is what is it in our culture that elevates an Elvis as the face of rock and roll and in that process erases the contributions of a little Richard? Mm -hmm. You know, there is there's room it, you know, it's like Tom Jones said, like there's Elvis, there's um, Buddy Holly, there's, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis. He said, but, you know, Richard's, Richard brings all of it together. He brings the music, he brings the fashion, he brings the swagger, he brings the personality. He's a great songwriter. He's an icon. Yes. And, and he planted the flag in 1955 with Tutti Frutti for rock and roll. Yeah, and it was interesting to find out what those real lyrics were. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and I say, fruity tooty, good booty. That's what it was. <laughs> it was until we had the other songwriter like change the word so that it could be played. But I, you know, also um, race does have a lot to do with it. And he really highlights that a lot in the film. He's like, you know what? I created this, but I'm black. They took it and they made it their own as well, and they get the credit for it. That's pretty much a, a strong message that he's saying in this film. Well, one of my favorite lines is from the incredible scholar, Zangia Robinson, who says, it's not about a, appropriation, it is about obliteration. obliteration. Because when you are obliterated, you are a race, your contributions are negated. And in the process of doing that, mm -hmm. your ability to make money mm -hmm. is, is, is cut into. Yeah. And so it is the obliteration um, that this film sets to correct. Certainly people knew Little Richard from, you know, Rubber Ducky singing that on Sesame Street or being on Pee Wee Herman or Full House or a talk show saying, shut up. Right. But he's so much more than that. So he much. is transgressive. He is affecting culture and he's shifting the energy yes. of culture. And you're not going to have Prince if you don't have Little Richard. Mm -hmm. And I would say you're not going to have Little Nas X if you don't have Little Richard. 
his presence is liberatory. Yeah. His presence at the time that he came up spoke of of reinvention of mm -hmm. this radical energy of coloring outside the very tight lines, lines yeah. especially that we as black people were put in and then also what queer people were put in. For sure. Like and he said, no, no, no. He said, no, no, no. <laughs> That's right. You know, he said, he said, or I love when he says, um, rhythm and blues had a baby and somebody named it rock and roll, you know, and that's really because it, the roots of church, uh, Negro spirituals, blues leading into R and B all that's where it all came from. That's the foundation of it. And he was born and raised in that. So this film is so important. When I watched, I was like, wow, this is, you know, this is telling the true story. So, Lisa, I, I wish we had more time, but um, we don't, <laughs> quite frankly. But um, where can people, if people missed it, um, and it's a one-night theatrical run, where can people catch up to it now? Uh, so, on June, I'm sorry, April uh, 21st, our theatrical run uh, uh, continues. Uh -huh. And also, our um, pay-per-view. Mm. Uh, and then several months down the line, it will be on CNN. Uh, more information on the film can be found at www.littlericharddocumentary.com. All right. Sounds good. Do you think it'll be on HBO Max as well? It, it will ultimately live there. Okay. But we are very lucky in our partnership with Magnolia Pictures to have theatrical visibility for the film and then go to pay-per-view so you can pay for it on Apple, Amazon, Google, then CNN, and then um, HBO Max. Yeah, so it's it's got a nice life and international in its exposure too. Fantastic. Okay. So go see it in theaters. You're going you're gonna to have an experience for sure. Sure. When you see with a whole bunch of people, so check it, check it out in the theatrical run. And if if you're still like, you know, I don't want to be around a lot of people, you have that option of pay per viewing it uh, beginning the end of April. So thanks, thanks again, Lisa. For yeah, Lisa, it's been an honor and a pleasure to meet you. We will continue to support your works. Keep doing the beautiful work that you do. Thank, thank you. you so much, and thank you both for all you do to make certain that our community is introduced to the stories and storytellers who are making positive change. I was unpredictable. They didn't know what I was going to do. Now you got to God damn it, show it to the world. Ow, ow, ow. My, 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 my.